I'm as I am the um, one of the, the people doing uh, orientation for new uh, contributors for the DreamWit project. I've been doing this since sometime in 2009-ish when the project started. Um, I also do uh, spam cracking and other random things, and I also have a day job. Uh, hi, I'm Kat. I'm known as Zarawi on most of the internet. This Kat is my staff account. I am the community and volunteer support admin, which means that I talk to the users and to the developers. I point out bugs um, and user documentation, schedule dinner, uh, handhold for new volunteers. I do a lot of community management stuff, so I'm on IRC a lot, answer questions, I'm just a friendly face. You can come to me if you have any questions about DreamWith. I may or may not know the answer, but I know who to point you to. I've been a nonprofit volunteer for 15 years. Uh, I've been doing nonprofit volunteer management for five. I've been working with open source projects for about five years, primarily DreamWith. Uh, I've been the co head of support for four and a half years and then hired in 2013. And I've advised on a couple other projects. So, uh, what's a DreamWith? Uh, DreamWith Studios <laughs> LLC is an independent community-based blogging platform that believes in privacy, accessibility, diversity, and freedom. Uh, we've worked from the Live Journal code base in 2008. We have about a quarter of a million lines of code. We're co-owned by Denise Pellucci, who's right there, and Mark Smith, who is someplace south of here. Uh, we have between 50 and 60 active volunteers across various parts of the project, and about two-thirds of them are women. 65% have never coded before they joined our project, and we have five field offices with mostly living rooms of varying quality, uh, six paid <laughs> staff, uh, paid interns as project requires, two ferrets, and a wide variety of cats. <laughs> In 1999 or so, um, Brad Pitts founded LiveJournal. Uh, from 2005 to, well, the present, LiveJournal has been sold various times. Um, in 2008, after a number of people looked at the ownership of Lab Journal and said, you know, maybe this isn't going to get better, maybe the thing to do is to just fork the project and reboot it. Um, so Denise and Mark uh, started Hypothetical Journal, which became DreamWit. Um, in January of 2009, the project um, abruptly took off speed when Live Journal yet again did things, um, dumped a number of people, including uh, Mark's then wife. Um, there was tons of interest in the project, um, but getting started, it was mostly really deep um, developer work, getting the project ready, paying down years and years of technical debt, getting it in a state where people could actually pick it up and develop on it, um, and the, the site would be launched. Um, meanwhile, there were a large influx of people um, without experience with the live journal code base, without even experience in coding, who heard about this thing and said, I want to help, what can I do? <laughs> that, that's me. So, <laughs> but among other people, obviously, but that's actually, I have no coding experience whatsoever. I wrote my very first curve patch because of <laughs> Denise had not coded before um, DreamWith and lacking other things to do. She said, well, let's see what I can do here and picked up projects. And now last night she wrote me a shiny new feature to help out with um, my anti-spam work. Um, <laughs> and then in, in May 2009, there, the uh, launch of the open beta happened and it's all been really interesting from there. <laughs> <clears throat> now the problem uh, was, and this is the sort of problem you want to have, great news, a lot of people want to help. Um, bad news, um, that can lead to a whole lot of disaster, and this is the look, interest is a problem you want to have, um, social and organizational disaster is a problem you do not want to have, and you want to head it off before it actually happens. So. Uh, the way we do that is by developing a constitution. So most of us had zero experience in community and project management when we joined, or very, very small amounts of it, and certainly not to this scale. We were swimming in a fast-moving river without a life raft, and it was 
kind of scary. Um, Denise had a lot of experience. Though. Denise had a lot of experience with that because only one of me. Yeah. <laughs> and while she has to wait for 26 hours, it doesn't just no. It, there's only one of her, and we needed other people. Um, so we just sort of jumped in. Um, I remember I started doing support two weeks, and then I was one of the heads of the department three weeks later. <laughs> So yeah, when they talk about getting your foot in like in the door, that's kind of how you do it. So some of the things we did worked. Uh, some of them didn't work. Some of them really, really did not work. Uh, some things we never expected to be all that important turned out to be an immense help, and we probably wouldn't have been able to do this thing without them. So the foundation of DreamWith was really uh, special. Um, and I don't mean that in the bad way. I mean that definitely in the good way. We had a lot of forethought. Uh, I believe that we actually had a business model before we had a name for the business <laughs> um, and kind of knew what was going on. And so from the very beginning, we figured out, okay, we want to be heading in this direction. This is where we want to go. So we knew that we... Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go point by point through these um, four things, the Constitution, the Quotes Database, the Jargon Page, and the uh, Welcoming Dance. Oh yeah, there's that. Uh, so, running it right definitely does need defining. You need to decide what your project is and also what it isn't. So, we decided that we couldn't continue defining ourselves as a code fork of Live Journal but doing things differently. Because not Live Journal isn't a way to really define yourself. You want to define yourself in the positive, not in the negative. Uh, code forks in general tend to have identity problems because it's really difficult to separate them from the existing project. So we decided to make sure that we did that efficiently. Um, we succeeded in some ways and didn't succeed in others. There were some parts of the existing volunteer culture of Live Journal that we did want to keep. So the close knit community, some of the ways that they handled volunteers were definitely really good. The trouble with upstream information movement was not something that we wanted to keep. And we figured that out really early and that's what we wanted to uh, work against. So what does right mean for you in your project? So that's going to be different for every group and every project. And you need to make sure that those ideals are actively meshing with the ideals of your volunteers. And either you need to change your ideals to fit those of your volunteers, or they need to change their ideals to meet yours, or ideally meet someplace in the middle. DreamWith had the amazing advantage of having some prior experience with technical and user environment. So Denise and Mark and the other people that they had clustered around them had to kind of figured out as they went when they were working on LiveJournal, bringing their experience and training and a lot of, well, I don't know, <laughs> that way. Okay, we're going to go, oh, no, no, okay, we're not going to go that way. We're going to go this way now, really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we say volunteers a lot. Um, that's because the staff is so small, um, but a lot of this generalizes to staff as well as volunteers. Definitely. Um, so basically, we just kind of used their little roadmap that they had built from their time at LiveJournal to sort of figure out our way as we were moving forward with Dream One. But because we aren't LiveJournal, we have a couple different growing pains. The, another thing I did want to bring up is that community building should be intentional if you have the time and the forethought. I recognize that not every project has the ability to create their culture from the ground up. So if you're halfway through and you've already started, you can always pick a direction, and you can always change. It might be tricky, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to sort of speed a shift that's heading in a direction, but you can. There's rudders, you just gotta find them. So it's also important to know what wrong means as well. Don't, don't find a negative, like I mentioned before, so not live journal isn't an option for us. Um, if there's bad code checked in, maybe there was a problem with the backup, no one was listening to user feedback, maybe somebody was using the wrong kind of feedback, Look at the task abandonment rates. So see what projects people have picked up and look at those and use those to evaluate what you need to change to move going forward. Um, let's see here. So a lot of DreamWet started with the social side of the project. As, as mentioned before, we had a ton of technical debt to pay down. We've been in business for five years now and we're still working on getting things up to speed. It was, what, 10 years of cruft. It was crusty and cranky and not really well maintained in a lot of places. Some of it was great, but a lot of that wasn't on the open source side. So 
we made sure that that was something that we were going to be moving forward with. But unfortunately, when you're starting a tech startup, if you don't have a lot of developers, it makes it a little bit tricky. But we had a lot of people who were really interested in the social side of things. So like me and Az, we were very into the whole, yay, I like this project, this is a great idea, Let's. what can I do? And so we became invested in the social side of things. Uh, set up our game plan was really what the, the project was looking at. We're looking at our backups, we're making sure that we're listening to the users. Uh, we wanted to validate our assumptions before we went forward on any course of action. So if we think that people are liking this, we actually want to make sure that people really do like this thing that we're doing before we sort of trudge off blindly into the dark. And we will not let that one guy go on the internet drunk anymore. I think he's just came out. <laughs> Oops. Um, so being inclusive was also something that we were really invested in. Uh, working on the diversity statement, guiding principles, making them really obvious and public and very publicized. So we do have a diversity statement, uh, which you can read here. There's a lot of it. You can find it up on DreamOfSideWork slash legal slash diversity. Uh, they're basically, we list out everybody that we include. So by gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, ability level, political opinion, uh, we welcome activists, artists, bloggers, crafters, ordinary people, extraordinary people, and everyone in between. And that's important to break that out and tell people who are interested in your project, yes, we actually know, we actually do want you. You, the person over there just sitting in the corner who doesn't think that we want anything to do with you. No, actually, we're specifically inviting you. We want you to come and be part of our project, whether you're just a user or if you're an actual developer or a volunteer or you do anti-spam or even if you just sit in IRC and do nothing other than cheerlead. That's important. And then we also have our guiding principles, which are open access, interoperability, open source, community review, and respecting privacy. Those are the things that we respect. We make sure to put them right up on the website. It's really easy to find at the bottom of pretty much every site scheme page. Uh, so yeah, it's important to make sure that everybody knows what you want them to be doing. The last thing is to say what you need to say. And the interested parties are going to read it. And the people who aren't interested are just going to do their thing. And it's up there if they want to have access to it. So just make sure that you're really clear about what you want and what you don't want out of your users and out of your volunteers. And sometimes we were not the best at actually um, actually um, following up on doing those things and people called us out for it. Um, there was a lot of legacy code. Um, sometimes that legacy code was not good and one of the common sports around the time of the founding, especially while going through all of that, was in fact to um, go through the code, mock it, and just let off steam by yelling about what was going on. Um, but it was simultaneously important for us to have a culture of support for the beginning developers. Um, we were starting to welcome new developers in, and we wanted to let them know that this was a judgment-free zone where they could feel free to check in um, code that wasn't polished and perfect. Um, we'd have somebody reviewing the code, and the person reviewing the code was committed to um, being respectful when reviewing the code. Nothing like, this sucks, do it again, TLDR, but um, this algorithm here doesn't do what I think you meant it to do, um, maybe try this approach. Um, that there um, doesn't conform to our style guide. Um, our style guide is this. Um, if you have further questions, um, please get back in touch and I'd be happy to go over in more detail. And that did not line up with um, mocking some of the things that Brad had committed um, in 1999 in his dorm room with BML um, at 4 a.m probably while intoxicated. <laughs> <laughs> and once we were called out on it, um, there, there was pushback. Um, it wasn't really a pretty scene. Um, but we thought about it after um, we, you know, cooled down. We thought, yeah, you know, um, that person was correct. Um, we really need to not be doing that. Um, and it died down to a um, a um, cursory Brad in his dorm room with BML every now and then. 
but not nearly as frequency, frequently. Mm -hmm. I may actually even remember it the last time. <laughs> to be honest, I actually really don't. So to go back to what Axe was just saying, you do have the opportunity to shift. Your culture is going to drift. It's not going to be the baby that you think you're bringing up. It's going to change and be something else, somebody else. And so it's important to be aware of those shifts and to be able to correct courses needed. Course corrections are never going to be easy, and they're very rarely going to be comfortable. You're taking this big, titanic-type object and trying to avoid this iceberg. So you want to make sure that you have backup. You want written documentation of what you want. So we have our guiding principles on the website. We also have an IRC code of conduct. So if we have people in our IRC channel who are making uh, sexist, ableist, racist comments, remarks, anything along those lines, we can say, hey, no. You stop right there, because look, we have a code of conduct, and it's right there, and it says you can't do that. Rather than somebody who they might not know as being an authority in that group trying to get them to stop, you actually have something, no, 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 it's right there. It's just literally like right there. Here, here you go. Go take a look at it. Thank you for reading that. I appreciate that. Please don't make those types of comments again. Yeah. They don't have to put it everywhere. They just need to not do that in our space. It's our space. So if we need to make it safe for not just them, but for everybody. So figure out when those principles are coming into conflict with the things that people actually do. And so ultimately, the behaviors are going to have to change the principles are. Most of the time, you're going to want those behaviors to change. You set your principles for a reason. Not always, but the majority of the time. And then when you figured out where you want to stand, if you figure out that you've been in the wrong and you were doing something that maybe really wasn't the best, like Brad in his dorm room with BML, say, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. We were wrong. Not, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. You want to give an actual sincere apology and make sure that that comes across as sincere, not as condescending. You also want to make sure that you're being flexible. So your project is going to mold the contributors, but your contributors are also going to mold your project. So when people with different experiences come in, you're going to get a little bit of shift, and it's just going to change. The project that Dream With was five years ago is definitely not the project that we are now. A lot of the stuff on paper is the same, but the culture has changed. And I think it's changed for the better. Um, we've had, well, we were actually just talking about this today. In our IRC channel in the last couple of years, we've had a lot less work inappropriate commentary, um, less casual harassment than we had before. We never really had all that much, but it was definitely a thing. And that was part of what we brought over from my journal's culture. As we've continued, we've become a lot more respectful of people's needs of their comfort levels and trying not to actively chase people off. And uh, one of the first things uh, that we got started on after the, um, the, the uh, principles and the, the idea was in place was we just forked a new IRC channel and as IRC channels happen, um, quotes databases sometimes follow. Um, somebody said something funny and somebody said, hey, let's put that in the quotes database and we realized, whoops, we don't have a quotes database for this channel. Hey, somebody get on that. Um, regular um, quotes databases like bash.org were really um, it was a private server, um, it was a culture unto itself, um, and there was really no, no need to put it up somewhere uh, with other channels, and the tone was really a lot less um, racist, sexist, um, and generally horrible than the things you find in most quotes databases. Um, it was fun, um, it gave a little um, cultural snapshot, you could go back and say, oh yeah, I was there when, and it was just, it was just fun. Um, and we never, part. I still do that, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> It'll be like 3 a.m. and I'm just like, huh, you know, I want to go back and then, like, oh yeah, that's where Mark forgot to start at my house. <laughs> that's where he killed Memcache on the production server. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's a way that you can keep your culture cohesive and also give cultural context moving forward, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Yeah. Um, DreamWorth does not um, uh, smile upon people who post the full logs in public. We prefer that that not happen. We'd like a place where people are 
um, reasonably free to speak their minds within the guidelines of our channel rules and public logging is um, not really the best way to handle that. We don't care if people log it privately. We just like if they share it to share it with discretion rather than fire hose style. Um, so a quotes database lets people share the good parts without sharing the whole thing. Um, it's a great introduction for newcomers. Um, there's at least one person uh, who was dithering about whether to join the IRC channel or not, and she took a look through the quotes database and said, you know, I think I actually would like to share space with these people. I'm okay with that. Uh, I, I think I'd enjoy these people. Um, so that's what she did. Um, it also serves as a quick briefing on the existing culture for people who maybe aren't so comfortable um, going into a space where they don't know how to act. They may read the rules, but they don't really have a feel for how that translates to talking to people um, day to day. And if they get a look at the things that the residents have judged the best, the kindest, the funniest, the most historically significant, um, and voted on those things, um, thumbs up, thumbs down, they can say, oh, okay, this is the sort of behavior that people here reward. Uh, I, can, I can try to emulate that behavior. Um, it's also, if people go say, I am going to start a history of how our IRC channel is. <laughs> it would be big, important, and kind of dull, and I'll forget to do it um, and stop doing it within a month. Um, when you have it as a quotes database, um, it's a little less, it's a little more low friction. People say, oh, that was funny, I should um, memorialize that, um, put it up in the quotes database, um, have a laugh over it a couple years hence. Um, you can also go through the quotes database and see where it compares to the, the group's constitution. How is this some, is considering this funny, something that the Constitution is actually okay with. Um, was that a sexist joke? Was that a racist joke? Um, was that um, mocking a, a new developer in a spirit of meanness? Um, were we all laughing together? Or are we um, laughing at that person? There, were, there was like one time when somebody said, somebody did or said something that everybody else thought was hilarious and meant it kindly, but that person said, no, actually, I'm really embarrassed about this. Could this go away? And then it went away very quietly. We also created a wiki page with uh, the common jargon that was used in the channel. Um, the illustration here is of a spoon. Um, in disability advocacy culture, there's a jargon term called spoons, basically hit points um, for people who don't already, don't really have that much energy. You, you spend all your spoons for the day and you're really out of luck. Um, and somebody was saying, yeah, I'm out of spoons. And somebody else said, spoons, what's that? And so people had to go and hunt down PDF, which explained the spoon theory, and I said, you know, the second time somebody asked, what's a spoon, um, there should be a wiki page for this. The, uh, the, the process was just to, there were so many questions, and I figured, okay, let's just put this in a wiki page, Let, let's get it over with, um, we, we can link people to it. Um, we have other things that we could be doing here. Um, the, let's just have a central place, and, and then we don't have to keep actually researching the same questions over and over. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I decided, um, just in the interests of time and practicality, that if it was asked about twice, that needed frequently asked, and it should go on the jargon page. Um, and that resulted in not the things that the in-group thought were important, making it into the jargon page necessarily, but the things that people who 
were enough out of the in-group to say, uh, excuse me, uh, this thing you all seem to know, what, what exactly is that? And then it would go on the jargon page because it was a thing people were asking questions about. And that really helped um, people who were not part of the existing culture to, to feel more welcome in, in the culture and get used to how things were done. And soon enough, they actually knew the references. Because we decided just two, two questions about it were sufficient to make it in. Um, document things early before they get um, too many people um, really confused by them. Um, you can go through when you're documenting things and say, you know, nobody's really mentioned that thing in, in three years. Does it really need to be on the front of the top anymore? Um, you, you can have really weird jargon fads, like the, the whole dog or doge thing. That image um, is up on my bulletin board at work with the image with the caption dog food on it. Um, <laughs> that's really bad. <laughs> that's really bad. You can't. It was David. It was David. Oh. <laughs> um, and <laughs> you didn't tell me that was on your thing at work. <laughs> no, it actually it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> it wasn't me, but it was. Um, okay, anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, just, just if, if suddenly all of your people are, are talking about um, something, um, you may well want to um, just roll with it and document it, unless it's something that's actually um, bad, because some things, why fight it? Mm. We've got a uh, football field. So if we're talking or if we're going to go be talking, we just say football field. And that's actually in the jargon page. It's just like, okay, when they say football field, don't, they're not going to go put on like pads and helmets and stuff. They're actually just going to go like talk to each other on the phone. And that's something that came up a couple times. And it's important to make sure that everyone knows what we're talking about, I guess. I don't know. It more sense in my head, so don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we've got a welcoming dance. We're like bees. So bees, when you're coming to the hive, they're like, hey, what you doing? Let's go get some honey. It's over there. Uh, or there's some really awesome flowers that are over in that general direction. We should go that way. And that gives the bees an idea of where they're going to go. We just mostly really like bees. Um, <laughs> so uh, having that, that culture that has that built in innately when there's new people being like, hey, 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 this thing's over here and this thing's over here and that thing's over there and you know, your exits and everything and please be nice to your flight attendants. That's really important for us because we do want to be welcoming and inclusive. That was one of the first things that got brought up when DreamWorks was getting started is that we wanted to make sure that everyone felt welcome because some people were feeling in the previous cultures like they'd been excluded and we didn't want to do that. So we have a welcoming dance. Sometimes we miss things, and sometimes it wasn't consistent because it was different people doing it at different times. Because if you get somebody coming on at 2 a.m. East Coast time, that's 10 a.m. You have shifts. You know, every IRC channel has shifts where you have so and so is usually on from here to here, and then overlap. And you're the exception. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, but yeah. Um, so, Jesus' so, sleep schedule is um, literally unplottable. It's, Kind of I have graphs. It's hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes people didn't stick around because it wasn't consistent and they would miss things. And that really sucks when somebody comes in and is all excited about your project and then you never see them again because you scared them off. Let's maybe try not doing that thing. So we saw that as a problem and we tried to remedy it. We, at the beginning we had way too many people coming in at once. Um, it might not necessarily seem like um, that if you've got like um, three people a day, but that's still, you know, 20 minutes of somebody's time um, orienting this person, um, and that, that adds up. I still have, not as frequently anymore, but every once in a while, I will still wake up in a cold sweat wondering what happened when I was asleep on IRC. 
because of this specific time. And I know that sounds really bizarre, but you have to understand, I was trying to manage a lot of things all at the same time, dealing with finals, dealing with one of my friends dying, and then this huge influx of new people, and oh my god, what are we going to do? Cold sweat, not even joking. Uh, maybe like once or twice a year right now, but it used to happen really frequently. Uh, so with all those new people, everyone had questions. Everyone was interested in different things. Some people were interested in support. Some people were interested in documentation. Some people were interested in developing. Yay, developers. But how do you how do you get all that information across to them? They're such different people. They're different groups of people. So it's really important to properly inform, greet, and orient them. Make sure that they're heading in the right direction. And the founders and the senior volunteers just flat out didn't have time. We were dealing with a lot of stuff, and it was really tricky to make sure that there was always somebody in IRC who had the knowledge and the ability necessary to make sure that that happened. So the obvious thought is to think about automating it. Whenever somebody joins in for the first time, you have a bot who has a list and is like, oh, that's the first time I've seen that, Nick, and blah, 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 blah. Here's a bunch of links and a bunch of stuff. But that's not really very welcoming, and as was the person who was kind of coming up with this welcoming dance at the time, and was very offended by the idea that her job could be replaced by a robot. <laughs> it's not uncommon, unfortunately, but it was something that we needed some automation. And so we came up with a semi-automated way. We have a bot on the channel called Infobot, and you can dump in a tag and basically say Infobot, comma, whatever, uh, QDD. Infobot jargon, and you can put a link in, and it'll spit that link back out. And so, what we do now is when somebody comes into the channel, we say, Hi, welcome to Dream Month. How are you? What are you interested in? What you do? And I like your shirt. I like your shirts. And talk to them a little bit and find out what they're interested in. Once they have that base level of knowledge about, hey, this is what Dream Month is, rather than just being a random channel on Freenode, we can say, Okay, here you go. Here's information relevant to your interests. We have the uh, QDD and the jargon page. If you're just interested in coming in and being social because you're already a user of the site, you might be interested in doing something, but mostly you just want to hang out. Or if you're interested in doing development, well, here's a bunch of information about development. Here's how to get one of our hosted uh, development sandboxes. Here's some information about the CLA. Here's all that kind of stuff. And so you can sort of tailor that welcoming dance to the person that's coming in. So it's not fully automated, and you still have that personal personal touch, but you're not losing that entirely. Because Dream Month is four people, five people, and we're all humans here, mostly. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So sometimes those conversations go a little bit better than others. Unfortunately, there's not really a whole lot that you can do to automatically know how somebody is going to best respond, but by having it not be fully automated, you have a little bit more control over that. Oh, let's see here. So the risk of getting that welcoming dance wrong. You will alienate potential volunteers. You could create a negative buzz. No. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> Um, wait, for real or no? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> managing within the law course. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I haven't gotten fired for at least six months, so I'm really excited about this. <laughs> the, um, if you not create an exclusionary reputation, uh, we have one going into this, which actually I didn't know about until today because apparently I'm just that clueless and wasn't paying attention. But Dream Month started out with invite codes, and we started out right at the beginning saying, nope, we're not going to have open registration at all. You have to have an invite code to get in. Or pay. Or pay. Or you can give us money, or you can get an invite code. And there were a limited number. There weren't, they really weren't that limited, but the perception was that we were being very exclusionary. This goes back to those guiding principles that we were talking about earlier in that uh, diversity statement, saying what kind of people we want. That was partially created in conjunction with adding those invite codes to make sure that we didn't seem exclusionary. But we still had that problem, unfortunately. Um, it discouraged potential people from coming into the channel because, oh, those dream with people. They're too fancy for me. Uh, and that really is unfortunate because they could have gotten interested in doing Floss software. They could have done something for us. They could have done something for themselves. And we failed them, and that really sucks. 
but we didn't get it right all the time. But fortunately, with time, generally comes a little bit of wisdom, and we've gotten a lot better about it over the last five years. And I think we've got it now pretty good. It's not perfect. I mean, not everybody that comes into your channel is going to be a perfect fit for your community, and not everyone that comes into your community or your GitHub or wherever you're doing things and stuff, they're, not everyone's going to fit. And you just need to recognize that. But it is really a good idea to try to have as many avenues for them as possible. So I have a note here saying fire hoses don't have time to get it perfect. It, it did take a lot of trial and error to basically at that time I um, I was looking for a job which meant I had a lot of uh, more spare time which I should have been spending on looking for a job um, than being in IRC at all hours. Um, but every morning when I woke up one of the first things that I did was I would read what had happened in IRC while I was asleep. And uh, I am an info for. I pattern match, I look at things, I see what things have in common, I see, try to see how things, why did it go differently this time, well maybe that thing. And I, I noticed um, a few things. A lot of times um, the person was trying to connect with a specific project, um, but the project leader wasn't around, um, and they'd say, hey can I talk to the person who um, leads development? That person's not available, they go away, it takes a couple days for them to actually get in the, the right place at the right time, and then their question is something that um, a lot more people could have answered. Um, so we tried to, I tried to get some of those things in up front. We tried to encourage a culture of asking the question you want to ask and then connecting it with the right person rather than waiting for the right person and then asking them the question. Um, sometimes you don't need to talk to the development lead. Um, sometimes your question is, how do I get a hosted um, development environment? And many of the people who have very little development knowledge at all happen to know this from hanging around the channel. Um, I tried to, you know, figure out what some of the common elements were in people who would ultimately uh, cause a problem and then leave. And I noticed that if you gave people the social expectations, um, like the rules um, up front, what the project was about, um, that some of those people would say, oh, uh, thanks, and leave, rather than sticking around and causing a problem. People who came, who had heard of the Dream With project through open source had a lot different um, questions and needs than people who already had Dream With accounts and wanted to get um, into the open source side of it. People who, like people from open source, um, maybe didn't know what the Dream With project was about and would want to know about um, what site was, blogging, social, social blogging, and the diversity statement, and no, you cannot say those words in this channel. Um, people who came from the site um, might not have any clue about open source. Um, people who came in through free node search, um, who were just looking for a place to chat, um, often didn't realize that the channel was attached to a specific project and were just there to make fart jokes and cause trouble. Um, and they could do that somewhere else. But since we at that time had chat in the channel topic, they said, oh, chat, I can do that. <laughs> and then they'd come in and there were problems. It ended poorly. <laughs> <laughs> it ended very poorly. <laughs> so, story time with Cat Nass. Uh, it's, yeah, I feel like we should have cookies, maybe a little bit of milk, it'd be fun. Uh, so, obviously, dealing with a fire hose, we have five minutes. Okay, we're going to talk really fast. So, dealing with that fire hose. That's slower. Um, okay. So, I talked a little bit about that before, how that was kind of a bonding experience for everyone who is in IRC at that point. You kind of. You, that's where you got your match. You're like, okay, I can do this. And you got a little bit of encouragement and you felt like you could pretty much tackle anything. Hey, 
yeah, you know, whatever, I can cut them out. And I dealt with open beta. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a really overwhelming time in everyone's lives. It was, it was, it was, are you okay? Okay. <laughs> She'll recover. Okay. Uh, so, as we talked about the knitting enthusiasts. There was some guy who came in because it, it was discussion about open source and fiber arts. He found it through um, a search for some somebody's quotes, and he said, are these my people? These are my people. Um, and he seemed to settle in fairly well, and it was kind of awesome. Um, later on, um, he was... Um, Problematic. Uh-huh. He, he, he just kept bringing up topics that were against our code of conduct, and we said, look, um, you, you've really got to chill with that, maybe you should um, leave us for a while, and he hasn't, he came back a few times, but he's generally moved on in his life, and I wish him every happiness away from us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we do host development environments at DreamWith, so if you want to learn to code, you don't necessarily have to deal with setting up our crafty, cranky, crotchety old code on your own server will just be like, hey, here you go, have your fun, here's your login, go do your thing. And that's something that came about partially from our community. And we're just like, yeah, no, this is too much work. It's really difficult for people to set up our code, and we've recognized that. Um, I think to date, we've had like maybe, what, five people actually manage it? I did it myself, and I was really proud of that. I'm proud of you for that, because that was yeah. tricky. I think it's like been four or five people. Yeah, four or five people over the course of the entire project have ever managed to set up our code functionally on their own servers. So that was something that came about from our community. We decided that was important and went forward with that. Uh, Colleen? Yeah. Um, well, uh, one, one person, after we, we got the hosted environments and we were really proud of them, one person came in and said, I would like to install the DreamWeb code. And we said, um, shiny hosted development environments, aren't you happy? You don't have to do this thing? And they said, no, actually, really, I want to do this thing. And it did take a couple go-rounds. Um, everyone was so um, in enthusiastic about um, the shiny new of development environments that they were not listening to that person. And that person um, wasn't necessarily communicating in the most clear way to say, no, I insist. This is what I want to do. Uh, I want to have this shiny technical accomplishment on, on my scout badge. Um, and, but we eventually um, realized what was going on there. Um, I chose a poor co-lead uh, for my anti-spam team, um, and that took that there was a lot of um, like three years. bad communication, and eventually they, they dropped out for personal reasons, um, and, and we finally said, um, you know, you and us were not the best fit. It, it was a hard conversation. Um, uh, I guess the only other, well, there's a lot of other things on there that we can talk about. Uh, did anyone have any questions or anything you wanted to bring up before Paul? I was going to applaud okay. if that was yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Pat Mad. Yes. I saw your hands moving. So I thought there was a question as well. Yes. Okay. Um, what's, the, what's the etymology of the full field? What? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. okay, okay, so I called as one night, and it was, like, really late, and I was just exhausted. When I get tired, I turn into, like, this babbling idiot, which is slightly different from my normal, like, daily babbling idiot, so <laughs> it's slightly more surreal, there's elephants, and it just goes very poorly. I live in a tiny apartment. Very small. It's, like, what, your bed and, like, your, like, everything. Basically. It's very small. Mm -hmm. And so, as was, I called her up, and I was like, hey, I want to talk. She's like, okay. I'm just gonna go get my headset. And so she like got off the phone for a minute so she could go get her headset. And she got back on. I was like, I always just imagine you running across a football field to go get your headset <laughs> when I call. And she's like, okay then. So ever since then it's just been for running she's running across the football field, which is actually around what, like five feet maybe? More like ten. Ten. Oh, ten feet. Oh that's <laughs> sure. Um so yeah, that's football field. Cool.
we've got some cool stuff. Uh, if you have any interest in our project, come talk to me, talk to her, talk to her, talk to them. Cool. Everything's wonderful. Then we keep asking questions or that? Ashish, you can ask questions. You specifically. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple questions. Uh, one of them is about the wiki jargon page. Uh, you talked about sort of casually expiring things from it as you discover they're no longer asked. And I'm more brought up. And I wonder, do you sort them by recency generally? How do you sort that key? They're alphabetical. Um, I'm not even sure what you do on that stuff, I think. We, we haven't, um, it, it's, it's going to be a project. I, I think that I'll probably go through and say, I haven't really started it yet, um, but there's, there's always the possibility of going through and saying, you know, um, this was mentioned like twice in the history of ever asked about twice, hasn't been asked about since, um, and then create an archival page um, with the things that have fallen out of use. It's roughly categorized. There's a couple different categories on the jargon page. Uh, oh, yeah, the is called Alex. There's the disambiguation for all of the Alexes, and I certainly was for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a lot of Alexes. It's kind of a problem. Um, well, not really a problem. You're not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Except when I am. <laughs> yes, but that's never in my direction. So okay. um, you can be somebody else's problem, that's just fine. Um, I uh, was wondering, this talk was about the developer community agreement, but do you have any thoughts on the user, uh, you know, blog writer community agreement and how it may or may not differ from LiveJournal? Uh, we have a lot of RPGers, which LiveJournal has a lot of them as well. Uh, primarily, I think the difference right now is that DreamWeb is primarily, well, not primarily, but we do have a large quantity of RPGers, and LiveJournal is almost entirely Russian user base at this point. Now, we do have some amazing Russian users who are super awesome, and we really enjoy them. Um, sorry, uh, my brain just sort of shorted out there. Um, <laughs> no, but like in a good way. Uh, but yeah, we, we take a look at that user base on a pretty significant basis. And yeah, and we have, we've had five years to go in a different direction from LiveJournal. And so I do think that the user base has differentiated. Now, to a degree, there are some similarities still. There's still people who value a blog, like old school blog, not face journal blog or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that there is the person, our user, what are they called? Schemes? These are people? Uh, personas. Personas. Our personas are different from my journals. Um, we want different people, and that's what we actively go after. That's what we market, what we market to. And uh, any other questions? All right. Awesome. Everyone.